use this to make sure it works before our speaker starts out. Welcome friends. Our speaker this evening was born in British Guiana. His father was Mongolian Chinese and a Buddhist and his mother Caribbean Indian and Spanish and Roman Catholic. Reverend Lay's heritage then is a blend of two respected religious traditions. When Reverend Lay first came to the United States, he went to New York where he made his living working for a corporation. Later, he lived in Canada. While in Canada, he became affiliated with the Self-Realization Fellowship and taught yoga. For those of you who are not familiar with the term yoga, I might give you the definition from Webster's Dictionary, which says, it is a practice involving intense and complete concentration upon something, especially the deity. In order to establish the identity of consciousness with the object of concentration, usually it involves some certain postures and breathing is very important. So Reverend Lay talked yoga and meditation classes for several years under the guidance of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. In 1969, while attending an East-West conference at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Reverend Lay met Swami Anand Saraswati of New Delhi, India who was, had been one of Mahatma Gandhi's close aides in the movement for India's independence. The Saraswati is an ancient yogic order and its name indicates a spiritual path through knowledge and wisdom. <coughs> Adana Lay was initiated into the Saraswati order and given the title of Swami Nityananda. And again, for those of you who are not too familiar with the term, Swami is a Hindu title of respect for a religious teacher. In Western religion, we just say reverend, don't we? Reverend Lay had spent five years in the solitary yogic retreat in California before receiving this honor. And while continuing his work and teaching in yoga, and metaphysics, as well as lecturing around the country. Reverend Lay also acquired an MD degree and is a licensed 
naturopathic physician. Reverend Lay now lives in Houston, Texas, where he directs his own clinic, a center for holistic preventative therapy, and instruction in self-transformation techniques. Many of us yearn for a greater sense of peace in our lives. But this is not an easy thing to achieve as we go about our daily task of earning a living and sometimes dealing with irate customers and disgruntled clients and things of that nature. The attainment of peace through the practice of meditation is one of the things that Reverend Lay teaches. I believe that Reverend Lay conveys the feeling of peace. The subject of tonight's teaching is is the spiritual life a science or a philosophy? <clears throat> it is indeed a great pleasure to present Reverend Hanada Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Good evening, friends. I want to make one comment of this building. Because years ago when I came into this area, I had my first uh, indoctrination into uh, Native American uh, healing techniques and religious concepts. It was in a building shape like this we call a kiva. And now I'm coming back and when I spoke to my blood brother this morning, he said, you're back home. <laughs> so all these are very significant to me. And I'm glad to be able to convey tonight what spirituality is. The question is, is it a science or a philosophy? A philosophy can leave you in nebulous regions of thinking, but not necessarily get down to the nitty-gritty of practical everyday living and measuring it. So, oftentimes we make statements in philosophy and then we regret it because we can't demonstrate it. Now when you look at science, science is very specific. Sometimes you have to be dogmatic too. But science has a value in this respect. Science always uses definite facts that can be applied any place any time to produce a desired result. Any type of information that will conform to that formula will be classified as science. And a compilation of facts that can be applied any place, any time, and get the desired result, you have science. Now spirituality would have to conform to this formula, otherwise we can discard it and say it doesn't match really some philosophy. So tonight we will try and see if we can apply or focus on facts about spirituality and apply them in the place and the time to get the results. Number one. In spirituality, you have to work with your body. Think of that. This human body is yours. All right, let's find out one fact about it. That is valid that you can label and say, this can be measured every time. Fact number one, Losers can't be born. The sperm <coughs> that got to the ovum, was it a loser or a winner? It was the winner. Otherwise, somebody else be in your place. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we have fact number one. Anytime, any place, somebody gets pregnant, 
you know the winner is going to be born. <laughs> but that doesn't say that the winner can be a loser by the environmental programming. The winner can be programmed to think he's a loser and end up losing. But he is the winner by the mere fact he's born. Now remember that that doesn't turn off in you. You can turn it down, but you can't turn it off. That's another fact about yourself. You can turn down the winningness in you, but you can't turn it off in you. Because the power that gave you the opportunity to be the winner is the driving force of your existence. We call it the creative principle. It's inherent in you. You cannot turn it off, but you can turn it down. Your willpower and your ego can turn it down, but they cannot turn it off. The reason why you can't turn it off is a fact based on the principle of hearing. You are a hearing mechanism. You are a mechanism that hears. And the sense of hearing cannot be turned off even after you're dead. You may not like it, but it's a fact. Otherwise, no medium will call you back. Now, if you remember Saul, when he uh, went to see the witch of Endor in disguise, and uh, when the witch called on uh, Samuel the prophet, Samuel rebuked Saul for calling him up from the grave. He didn't come to see Saul, he came to call him up. So mediums know they really have to call beings out of the invisible realm in order to make contact. But then they can be seen also after they're called up. So hearing, fact number two, not turned off. Number three, the moment you're born, you make a son. It doesn't care what sex you are or what nationality you are, we all say the same thing. Very common fact, common expression. And if you look at the mouth of the baby or the child when it cries, it only expand out. But it cannot expand out like that to cry if it doesn't take the oxygen in and have the cord severed. So inhalation and then ah it's out. That very motion of crying is nature's first indication that the organism, like your car up there, is turned on. And the carbon dioxide is being filtered out, and oxygen is going in through the cellular carburetor now, known as your nostrils in your lungs. <coughs> See, these are facts. You can't eradicate them, you have to work with them. Then the mother noticed a strange thing. The child does like this. That is telling the mother it's hungry. Of all the uh, functions in the body, it wants to eat right away. And you know, it eats by nursing from the mother, but like this. It doesn't open his eyes to see what's eating. As long as it doesn't do that, it's in a state of ecstasy and the parent is very happy. Leave the child by itself and go off and do something and should it wake up? It may cry to tell it's awake, but it will satisfy itself by reaching for something to put back in its mouth. Parents then have to be very careful 
not to leave objects around or it ends up in the baby's tummy. And then you have more problems now. Here we see a very important behavior, regardless of sex or color, a function that the organism is reaching out to do. Learn by eating. Well, according to my teacher, he would say, that's very good, Adamo. You need uh, 30 years of that kind of living to muck it up. <laughs> so don't get excited or don't try to change it from nobody. Let them muck it up for 30 years. Because that's how you know it's going to be a science now, not a philosophy. Because they have a, a cluttered up toxic mechanism to correct and clean up. And until they have that to work with, they're not going to believe a single word with it being a science. They'll all think you're a weirdo or a philosopher trying to convert it. But let them muck it up, plug it up, then they'll want to change. Well, I hate to say the truth, this applies to me too. <laughs> I didn't muck it up too. I used to weigh 180 pounds. Looking neat and nice, good old fashioned New York diet. <laughs> <laughs> But that is necessary to learn. Don't try to change people because you can't change them. You can only change yourself. When the body is toxic, and it gets toxic first by putting something in. But you notice your parents will tell you, and they have a responsibility to you for 18 years according to the law. I don't know if it's still 18 or 21 or something like that. Let's say 18 just for that. And that's their responsibility to see that what you put in keeps you healthy according to the requirements of the school or the environment. And that you don't muck it up too much. Because it's very expensive, especially when you've got to go to the doctor for new teeth and this and then how fast it can happen. Very, very expensive, that was a problem. So they watch you for 18 years to see you organize your life, but you may not like it, and I don't blame you either. But that's the period you have to learn to experience confirmation, restriction, and persistency. You may not use it right away, it may be imposed upon you to set up certain behavioral functions in your mechanism. It is when you plug it up and then have to clean it up, you're going to find out those disciplines are going to come in handy. But you don't know that until you mess it up. Now, this body is what you have to work with. You can be programmed a whole spectrum of ideas about what it is or what it's not. What to do and what not to do. But until you get sick, you really don't know what to do. And you find yourself very helpless. And with the program TV, you may reach out for the closest tranquilizer which is valid enough to be there because that's part of the programming. You gotta make mistakes and learn too. You may put a lot of uh, tranquilizing products into yourself, but still not correct the problem. Then you're gonna get bored and angry, and you're gonna look up at the sky and shake your fist. It's all your fault. But that's good too, because you're getting ready now to look at yourself objectively, not to look at yourself from a religious context, be it Buddhist or Christian or Islam, but you're getting ready to look at yourself objectively. Is there any valid use for me cleaning up myself? Is there any real reason for me to get healthy? Is there any real reason for me to want to find out what makes me tick? 
I can be inspired by the lives of great men. I can be inspired by the corrections of the different illnesses by people who pray. But yet, I may pray and not get no results. What? Am I left out? Am I single out never to get cured? Maybe my time in Congress to be hatched up like eggs, you know? So cleaning up again is a matter of fact of time. So timing now is one of the facts about the spiritual science. When is the time to do it and when is not the time to do it? The brain is exposed to a great deal of data. People teach you a lot of things to do, to survive, and to remember in order to get through to get an education. And yet, somehow, it seems so shallow, so inefficient, when there is a depression in the society. How do you fit in? How can you cope when the prosperity level has dropped down? Then you're threatened with the possessions that you have and the inability to pay for the coverage of it. All of us are happy now until you're told to the next time that you can't go to your house and sleep tonight. Then you're going to see everybody quaking all over the place. Because you start to imagine the unimpossible and more impossible problems that will come up because you can't go in and get it on the shelter at night. See what a tremendous pressure that is on your brain. No place to go lie down at night. And this applies to the body. Why should it apply to the body? Because we have to care for it so that overexposure to the elements don't injure it. That puts us in states of responsibility as far as the mind is concerned, the functioning responsibility of your mechanism. How responsible are you to this mechanism? You can't leave it out, and therefore you will always be praying to that fellow up in the sky, though you may shake your fist and you don't get your way, but you're still asking, Look, I need to sleep out of some place tonight. I hate to be back all night by the rain or constantly hiding on the stone bridge. That part of your factual self comes up now. Your internal attitudes. Then comes a part of you that gets what we call dreams, precognitions. You can't help having them, you do have them. Sometimes a blow in the head will give it to you, you'll see the light. Bump your head and you saw the light. And you wonder why it's there. That's the extrasensory part of you. And that has to be awakened, that has to be validated. It has to fit into the framework of who you are. And if it gives you a glimpse of conditions that will help you to better improve your existence, tell you where to go and sleep tonight, or where to find the next job, and what to eat to stay healthy, then you're going to rely on it. So that part of you is going to come up. And that's factual too about your structure. Last but not least, uh, everyone is going to walk out of the scene. Uh, either six feet under the ground or go through the wall. Pick a choice. Last time I saw them, um, they went down six feet under the ground. I haven't seen too many walk through the wall yet. So there we have something to consider. That's very factual about our mechanism. And it's going to challenge us all over the world, time and place. What do we do when we reach this point in time? Are we prepared for the birthday into the invisible? Do we make preparation for the invisible pregnancy? Did we make any 
restitution for the shortcomings while living in, in this visible realm and not owe anything when we go into that other realm to live. Now, I don't think for one moment we're going to escape anything. The bill collector still follow you. It's called Sonics. So if it follows you all the way, <laughs> you got those to pay for a long time. Then there must be something that we can do. What is that something we can do? For centuries, men have been calling that something spiritual life. Not religious life, because religious life can lead to fanatism. It can make you walk out and club your fellow man to make him believe in you. That has nothing to do with spirituality. Spirituality is like the oil in a nut that can only come out after a long series of getting rid of the flesh around the nut, squeezing the heck out of the nut and get the oil. But religious life can be brushing the flower up brushing the fruit up and make it look nice and beautiful in the vase. And say, here, look at me, I don't rot, I smell good. Yet inside the worm is eating as well. So don't get trapped in religious thinking, though we have to start someplace, and let's see if they don't have something to add to the process. Spirituality is what we're looking for and how to arrive at it. But we have to work with the facts of ourselves. And it's not something that ends up in a nebulous region. It's something that works moment to moment in a very practical, simple way all around you. And if it doesn't, then it's not spirituality. It's still wishful thinking. Number one, factually, you're born a winner. Number two, factually, you communicate with sound. You hear some waves. You compute it back to make it meaningful to you. So what you say to yourself is very important. That's the programming of the computer. Number three, you eat your way through life. And if you look, when you're young, you eat a lot. When you get to middle age, you start tapering off. When you get to old age, <laughs> you're phasing off, right? You don't feel to eat as much. But you eat, nevertheless, to the last day, before they phase you out, you're still putting something in your mouth. And we as therapists will try our best to keep you going, like an old uh, automobile, the see the gas will keep you going with the octane. <laughs> But if it holds up, but that's exactly what we're looking at the factual part of ourselves. What we eat. Nutrition is that part of you. Again, we can clog up the system. And we do that when we're not informed. And we have to clean it up. Because illness is the result. And illness forces us to seek correction. We can blame the heavens for the illness. We can blame a lot of things for the illness. But nevertheless, the fact is you're ill. And are you going to treat them? Are you going to quit getting ill? Are you going to be in charge of yourself so it doesn't come back and dominate you or weaken you that you don't have any control? Or leave yourself helpless to it? This is the cleaning up process. In scriptural language, they say cleanliness is next to godliness. I just happen to change it a little and say cleanliness is godliness. Because I have to work with it moment to moment in my mechanism. And I have to be conscious of it. And godliness is not holy and dull. Far from it. Godliness is practicalness. You will discover that for yourself. That's why this gathering today is not a religious gathering. And the friends of uh, invited me here are friends. I love you. 
Allah not in love with you. Because to be in love is to fall into love, and then I blame myself for making the mistake. But to love him, ah, we can have a wonderful relationship, wonderful communion, very unending, very rewarding. That's different. God is not in love with his world, but God loves his world. Cleaning up is practicalness. All right. As far as the body is concerned, and that's where we start, we can go to the mind, and we can go to the spiritual nature, but they happen to be in a range that tends to be nebulous at the moment. Investigation, research are in that field. And certain data have come down, but at the present moment, it will still be nebulous for us. We have to work our way through it. And then eradicate or eliminate what is nebulous about the mind and what is nebulous about the spirit. And see what is functional and practical, then we have an evaluation. Physically, we know we are a winner. We can make ourselves losers by talking to ourselves. Sonics will do that to us. Physically, we know we eat and make ourselves sick. Nutritional guidance corrects it. But this guidance didn't come merely by sickness alone. It was set up before we came. If you look back to all the writings, uh, no one would build an instrument without setting up a book of instructions on how to use it. I don't think any manufacturer would attempt that. Right? So a book of instructions on how to run this organism already pre-existed, maybe called the scriptural writings, or Veda, the eternal knowledge. But we might well call it book of instructions on how to operate this mechanism. Nutrition is given as one of, of the rules of the instructions how to operate. And it merely says, eat everything that moves on the face of the earth. Everything that bears seed for food and for medicine. Now, you know, that can be a very broad nebulous statement, eat everything that move on the face of the earth. Because you have a right to eat one another, if that's what it means. But the word move is used. It doesn't say eat everything that fly, or everything that walk, or everything that swim, or anything that crawl. It says, eat everything that moves and has seed and bear fruit or seed for food and for medicine. Now, certainly these men who wrote the book of Dham or this data or where they place it would not use such a word like move if they wanted us to eat creatures that crawl, walk, fly, or swim. They're very specific, right? But they are specific when they say move. This subject will not get from here, there, to here. No matter how it tries, it will grow longer and longer and longer, but it will not get from there to here until I do this. Take it from there and put it there. Then in essence, I moved it. Now, if those who know Dr. Vasant and our little dog, and he comes running through the room, he's walking and running all the same time. Now, if I clobber him and eat him, I'm depriving of his own self-motion. I'm not stopping him and lifting up and putting him in place. He has the ability to move on his own. So he runs or he walks. Yet, if you look back through time, Man had to eat not only what was capable of moving, 
but he also ate things that walked, flew, and swam for survival sake. Thus, clogging up the system by not knowing when to put it in. If he had to eat to survive, it was rational for him to catch the fish, catch the bird, catch the four-legged creature, also get the fruit or the vegetable that was in season, wherever he found it, because he was a migrant person, walking through. He didn't cultivate anything as yet. He was living strictly to survive. Like a child, reaching out to put it in the mouth. And sometimes, you don't like to leave a dirty diaper on. <laughs> so again, you see, the mouth has no way of differentiating until it is. All right. So man had to taste and try. And finally discover the practical mistakes in order to correct it. What they noticed as the man eventually got sick from putting in things incorrectly, certain individuals emerged trying to correct it in every culture. But where did these men get their ideas from if everyone started out equal? How could a, a group of people in every area suddenly produce one or two or three individuals capable of a super knowledge to resolve the problems and the mistakes that these people are making. In each group, we hear of these individuals, and they call them medicine men. And the word is right, medicine man. He does nothing but give you some medicine to ease the ache, or shaman, witcher. We haven't come too far. AMA, or the wise owl, and the porcupine or acupuncturist. Lie <laughs> <laughs> right down on top and then you get needle. We haven't come too far. <coughs> Cleaning up is where we are. The body has to be cleaned up. Okay. Yet, all these centuries we see men stepping out of the norm of behavior and going to the full ultimate of a behavior by certain ways of cleaning their bodies. If you put in something and it makes you sick, what is the natural behavior you would do if you saw it the next time? You wouldn't put it in. Right? Because you know it made you sick. So innately you would stay away from it or negate it or fast from it. That means you wouldn't eat it or touch it. So, but before you do that, little uh, dog that the sand has would have done it to show you so that you will learn from him. He would eat something bad and then he'd go out and eat some grass and bought it up. Clean up his power and lie down and don't touch things. And then you say, well, he's smarter than you. His mother got in trouble. Now his mother's getting out of trouble. <laughs> so you're cleaning up yourself. All right? You have fact number one, any place, any time, that you can start the process of cleaning up yourself. Fasting. The centuries, man, have applied it, and they all arrive at the same result. That is a, a functioning mechanism capable of performing practical action. It didn't make them more religious. It didn't make them any smarter intellectually, but it made them practical in terms of their environment to survive. The result is common factor. We see now they have peace of mind because they can sleep more peaceful now and not worry about the aches and pains of a 
clogged up stomach. They were feeling healthy. Spirituality is that quality of life that flows through you like a perfect tank automobile. Your organism is functioning time. It's synchronized and it's flowing without any tension. It's called peace that passes all understanding. It's not something you buy in the store or find in a book. It's the cleaning up in your mechanism. Okay. From the mouth standpoint, you can clean up the body. But you still got to realize you tell yourself you're a failure. You make mistakes and you may have doubts. You may have uh, all type of arguments about to do or not to do. And that is from age one to age 18. And you're bursting at the seams to redeem. And uh, you can do your own thing, you know. Mother, I'd rather do it by myself. Well, okay, honey, go ahead, do it by yourself and see how far you get. Mother ain't so stupid because mother had to pay the price or the cost factor for you to go on to be 18 years. So if you want to continue on your own, you'll find out how soon the cost factor becomes evident. Let's not kill ourselves. Our parents are essential. We may not put up with it or like it, but when you look at it in terms of what is involved in a spiritual understanding, their contribution on the cost factor for our survival, they give us the discipline. We may not appreciate it until we get sick and have to pay the cost factor. Then we look back at each other and say, Oh, mother, now I understand how you feel, or oh, daddy. And by that time, the compassionate part of both are opening up. That's the heart. That 18 years, or 21 years of frustrated living and battling not to conform, leaves a lot of traumatic conditions in us. And we can be programmed into all type of belief systems and yet they are not bad for a moment they are impractical at times when it comes to facing yourself because you have to look at yourself and act and that's one of the things about spiritual remedy it's a principle locked into us that forces us to act what we say, like it or not. We may not do it when we're kids, and we may rebel and go off, but to function in an adult world with the cost factor involved, you learn pretty fast, you act what you say, otherwise nobody hiring you. And there's no roof to crawl in under the night. So there again, we're becoming conscious now. We're not going to end up uh, fooling ourselves. We may end up healing ourselves. And a great brother once said, physician, heal yourself. Well, we're all physicians in a true sense of the word. It's knowing what to do with what you are <coughs> that brings out the wonderful qualities of you. This fact about talking or saying something and acting it is what one author would call positive thinking. Familiar with the book? Good. But at the same time, it's a book of instructions if you want to take commandments. They're a book of instructions. They're positive thinking. It'll you go full circle in the end that you have to say things to yourself and to act them.
the mind now becomes stressed out by too much programming. Have you ever been in a situation where you overprogram and feel stressed out? The, the clatter, clatter, clatter all day, and you just want to go there. In some corner to have a little peace and quiet. Good. That's very, very necessary to the mechanism. When you are cluttering, cluttering, talking all the time, you may end up getting angry and lose your sense of happiness. And that's what feeds the mind now. What feeds the body is the food and the cleansing of it so that you don't put it in the wrong place to make it more sick. When it comes to the mind, it's what you say to yourself. And the constant exposure of the repetitiousness of things that makes you bored. How to clean up the mind and find that part of the mind that keeps you happy. You need to have a factual principle about it. And let's see, here's a good illustration. Happiness is no way to be found but in a contented mind. Who has a contented mind? Anybody in this room got a contented mind? It's not possible to accomplish or acquire a contented mind. It doesn't exist. But think of it this way now. Happiness is nowhere to be found, but in the contents of the mind. Do you think it's possible that you can generate happiness out of yourself now? Happiness is nowhere to be found, but in the contents of the mind. Equality through the verbal situations of what you say to yourself to make you feel happy. And what you say in words can make you unhappy and what you say with the same words can make you happy because those are the contents of your mind. Numbers and letters. They make geometry or images. They make combinations or words that mean something to you. I'll give you an example of happiness being the contents of your mind and not the contented mind. D O G is man's best friend. I repeat, D O G is man's best friend. Spell it backward, it's still the man's best friend. We haven't changed anything, but we look at it Chinese way and Western way. Left to right and right to left. You see what you did with the power of your mind? You free yourself and work with the contents. And by working with the contents of the mind, you are releasing happiness out of it. So no one possesses happiness. That everyone is essentially happy from the very contents that are contained in mind. This is spirituality. This understanding is spirituality because you can apply this any place, anytime. And know that D O G is man's best friend. And G O D is still the man's best friend. And it doesn't matter if you're male, female, or whatever nationality you want to be, or whatever belief system you want to be. You know that the alphabetical content of your brain is releasing happiness for you. You don't have to impress anyone with it or try to make them believe you. It's not necessary. You being happy will make them think what you've got. 
they want to know what kind of natural high you're living on. You see, this is what's so interesting about spirituality once you understand it. Not some nebulous experience in some remote part of the world. It's in you. The very core of you. As far as the mind is concerned, and the happiness that it will release, it's based on the contents. Now, many of us here are walking around with approximately a half of a dictionary in your brain. You realize how many words in a half of a dictionary? <laughs> Let alone a whole encyclopedia that you can relate to, and still more to come. Don't sell yourself short. The spirituality is unending. Especially if you speak two or three different languages. That puts you in a wider scope of happiness. <laughs> As my brother John here was saying, more humorous, right? Good day. Buenos dias. They all mean good day to be happy. Yet if you can relate to all three, Ways of saying it, look how much happiness you're releasing. Then you begin to appreciate your fellow man. If he can't speak English and you can't speak French, <laughs> you can still shake hands. Hug each other. Smile. Happiness is going to be released. It's in the mind, the contents of the mind to know to reach out, to shake a hand. Even though we may not be able to talk the language, it will convey the intent. And that is where the spirituality of your brain is a factual experience, can be applied any place, any time, and get the result. Now, There are many techniques to slow the brain down. And they all border on the rage of sleep. You are very familiar with sleep from the time you were in the womb to the time you came out. You've been sleeping. So, to be honest with yourself, you were more psychic than you ever thought. But you never realized it. You never applied it. You never knew what it was. Then, like St. Paul would say, I rebuke you in your rejoicing, for I live and die daily in the Lord. He was shutting down every day, every moment, and getting into a state of semi-sleep or semi-death, and experiencing something within his organism that made him happy. So happy that he could reject external enticements to be happy. That's why he says, I rebuke you in your rejoicing, for I live and die daily in the Lord. Well, the Lord must be a super fantastic excitement. And if it's not going on outside, since we can't recognize it outside, then this excitement has to be someplace else. It's inside of us. It's stored up in us. And it's so exciting that outer behavior doesn't begin to give it credit. We don't have enough words to give it credit to that internal excitement, that internal synchronicity. We do have dreams, we do close our eyes, and we do reflect on memories. And it's fantastic when you think for one moment that yesterday you met me at the airport in a 
large airplane that occupies, let's say, uh, the, this size of this room and more. And you carry that whole image in your little brain for a heck of a long time. Huh? Isn't that fantastic? Now, if you want to recall that image without going over to the airport and looking at the airplane again, or getting a picture from them, you can just close your eyes and call it back on the screen. Now, this doesn't have anything to do if you're a male or a female or what you believe is, or what color you are. It simply is that you know you can close your eyes. And everybody close it in the room till they come out and they keep on closing it. And we close it till we end up doing nothing. So closing the eyes, most of the body. And I said yesterday when I was telling you folks, you can either keep it wide open, close it completely, or half open. Now, you may be accused of being an oriental sprinting all the time. But that's where you can actually turn back in on your own internal image or screen and recall what you have seen during the day with the eyes wide open. That half open, half closed state. Now, normally the eyes permit everyone in this room to look at. Looking at is valid because we can test you and say you have good eyesight because we can look at this thing waving in the air and identify it and call it a hand. That is looking at, A-T at. If I had it behind a glass, you will be looking at what? You'll be looking through. And that the transparency of the glass allows you to see through to the hand behind the glass. Good. Now, if this is possible externally for me to have a uh, see through, then it is possible for the brain to release this phenomenon to see through that wall. That's not miraculous, that's not religious, that's the real spirituality, the real atomic principle in you, seeing through. If you look at my hand, in the optical language, they call it concave vision. Because you have concave lenses over the retina. But if you look through, then you are focusing convexly for the first time. And it becomes like a microscope or a telescope. So you can see into the invisible or see through the mass to another level of observation. A blow at the head will give you enough conviction that you can see truth. Or you can take some hallucinogenic chemicals to convince you that the capacity to see truth does exist. But those are not practical means of acquiring it because they have a residual danger in it. A blow on the head can be permanent. You may never recover from it. A drug may be toxic, but may do damage to you. And you may never get over it. Yet nature could not have put us together and leave us out here in the wide open to survive if it was not intended that we release this quality inside. Kind of a superman X-ray vision, you know, the car can come on. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm, I know, but I'm blocked by lead. I can't see through. <laughs> That's very valid. Don't get yourself. Whoever's writing the comic books are writing some valid facts. The rate of the eyes can be accelerated to see through 
But when you come in contact with a lead object, it's reduced back to the at stage instead of the true stage. You, you can't see through that. So nature has some unusual qualities allowing you to accomplish things, but at the same time it restricts you in certain areas to make you respect it. Otherwise, you'd be very, very egotistical. And you try to show off that hurt yourself more than you hurt others. So, their see true is a part of our spirituality that can be validated, tested, and you. The higher spiritual nature now comes in terms of your cellular mechanism. What good is it to eat and never get sick? What good is it you can be so subtle with words and never make the wrong statement? You'll be a kind of diplomat that don't know how to say wrong. You always say yes, and you're never going to say never. Then you come to a level where you can see true things to the point where you may become egotistical and get carried away to the fact you can perform all type of manipulations in it. That is not sufficient to be spiritual. Though they are valid and they are factual and they can be used to be practical it's not sufficient to be spiritual. We must have some physical evidence surrounding us in our environment that would give us an unbiased view of the principle of spirituality. And it has to do with the cellular structure. The cellular structure has been stated that when it throws off corruption or breakdown or decomposition, when this cellular mechanism quits breaking down and takes on non-corruption, non-breakdown, non-decomposition, it's a glory unto the Lord, the creative principle. Now, this cannot be just mere hearsay. It cannot be something that we must wish for, because it wouldn't be valid. It must be something that is pre-existing before we came on the scene, dormant in the life principle, waiting to be released by us when we become conscious of it. Not before then, that is not, if that be the case, then it's valid. We have evidence of such function that will fit. A caterpillar is a worm. All it does is eat, <laughs> like you or not. And then it spins its cocoon, that's what gets ready to die. And out of the cocoon emerges an unusual creature, a creature that can fly, not crawl over the ground like a caterpillar, here is this creature that can fly, it's called a butterfly. Yet if you compare everything that actually is assigned to fly, they are not as beautiful as a butterfly. You have the most beautiful, intricate designs in the mechanism of a butterfly. Now, I have seen rotten caterpillars but I've never found a rotten butterfly to this day. If you find one, let me know. They will crumble into powder, but they will not rot. That principle is in resident in creation of the creative power within you. We came last on the scene of evolution or creation, and we are carrying it in us. We have to release that 
in order for spirituality to be a science. Otherwise, spirituality is not a science, it's a field of philosophy. But we have living people who have done it. And passed on, and we have records that their body did not decompose after death. They are canonized and called saints of all belief systems. The body not decomposing. Now, they also leave us with an unusual mechanism and at the same time they make us conscious that they were very simple, practical people. Spirituality is practicalness and transformation of this mechanism to its ultimate highest good non-decomposition as living testimony of what you carry within you. That does not limit the creative intelligence to leave a, a set of non-decomposing organisms here. There are evidence that many individuals never left their bodies after they reached the transition period. They took it with them. For one example, there was a man called Kabir who lived in the 16th century. His purpose was to unite Hindus with Muslims. He tried his best. And the day he died, the Muslim says, we must bury his body according to our tradition. And the Hindus said, we must cremate his body according to our tradition. And they argued back and forth what to do with Kabir's body. And by that time, Kabir got up and stood up and looked at them and shook his head and disappeared in front of their eyes and left them two roses. The Hindu took their roses and cremated it, and the Muslim took their roses and buried it. <laughs> now, you see the difference in spirituality and religious conflicts? The living organism that is carrying the inherent quality is ignored. The humanness is ignored. Now that we know it's a science, and it can be experienced, and it can be accomplished, here is the rub. Spirituality is the only science that is an art. No other art is a science to itself. Yet spirituality <coughs> is a science that is an art to itself. Because it's the art of living that you are accomplishing through a scientific process built into the organism that is locked in you, that you have to release. Not something you have to what? Construct around yourself. That's the difference. It is something you have to release, every one of us, including myself, have to release from within his organism. And that makes it the art. And that's what is the glory to God. His creation is an art. Cannot be duplicated, cannot be competed with. And his highest expression is man. His total inflection and reflection. Again I repeat, spirituality is the only science that is an art principle that you must release from within yourself and it's not constructed by your intellect around you but the ways to make it comfort are laid down by the factual parts of you 
the fact that you're born with them, that you have to talk, provide for the body, live in the world, and go through the internal re release of the mechanism's highest potential. But you have to release it. It is your greatest opportunity to get behind the wheel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lay. We'll have a 10 minute break, and if anyone wants to smoke, I'll ask if they do it outside of the mob. Besides, if you're ready to call, Soul and nutrition is based on not what you eat, it's when you eat it. I eat everything, but I know when to eat it. Also, you must know your blood type. You cannot follow it, otherwise you'll get sick. You want to stay healthy and function and realize your reality, you must know your blood type. Now, it is not what you eat, but when you eat it. That includes everything in this world, because of 144 minerals. To exclude one would be a violation of my creative structure. So people who come into the knowledge of this type of eating are um, taken back because it may go against their belief systems. But the wise man knows when to eat, not what to eat. That's why he's always ahead of the sick people who turn to him for help. A little of anything not something, anything, is medicine for your system. Too much is toxic and death. But by the same token, since a little of everything is medicine for the system, you must know when to put it in. Platinum chloride is a very toxic material. We use it to cure cancer, a special type of cancer. Given the wrong time of the day, you will die of pneumonia next morning. Given at the right time of the day, you live and go home. That's valid facts proven by medical research now. They are slowly coming around to understand that the intake or admission of any substance in the organism is synchronized to time. I said earlier tonight, you might have driven up here with an expensive piece of machinery costing $7,500. It's a car. Did you pay for $7,500 worth of parts or timing? You surely give them back the car if it's not running when it's out of time. Otherwise, you have a beautiful, expensive, antique junk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same is true of this mechanism. So solar nutrition, in terms solar, includes the light principles of our existence and the sonic principles behind it. And it involves knowing when to put it in. Now, I'll ask you a simple question. What food do you eat twice a day? Water. Water. 
you eat water twice a day. <laughs> Good. Uh, where is water formed? I see clouds, I don't see water. Till it collapses, then something occurs, it, then it comes down as rain. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. It's a gas, yes, but there has to be a temperature change in order for it to convert into water. Now, this particular temperature change can occur in light and in darkness. Definitely, it makes it a unique material that can be used 24 hours a day without stopping. You can never drink enough water. But water is not an essential food per se in terms of growth through an organism necessary for keeping the body functioning. It's like putting water in your radiator. It will not run the engine, but it will keep the engine cool when the engine is running. Water is necessary for flushing your system. It will keep you alive, but it will not give you the functioning mechanism the protein that is necessary for cells to grow, or the distribution of carbohydrates or minerals in the <coughs> mechanism. But it's necessary there like a, a cooling system for the refrigerating or the uh, part for the radiator of the car for your body to keep it cool and for it to eliminate waste products you need it. So you can use water 24 hours a day. But I'm asking the young lady now of a solid food that she would eat twice a day. Yeah. Yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah. Before it was ever introduced in this country, it would be good to eat it more than once a day. But yogurt made in this country is made out of cow's milk. It's not made from goat's milk, where it originally began. Goat's milk is alkaline. Cow milk is acid. You will develop mucus. Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> what food would you recommend eating twice a day? I don't eat any food twice a day because it's not practical. Every food is a sign, a growth cycle, and should be eaten once a day. Therefore, you have a whole spectrum of food that has every mineral necessary for all parts of your anatomy and spirituality locked into it. Before you came on the scene, the universe was set up as a spiritual principle, <coughs> and it's locked into the food already. We don't realize that. On the trees, we have fruits and nuts. On the ground, up to about five, six feet, we have animal, bird, vegetable, seeds. Under the ground, we have, in darkness, marine life, egg, or vegetables that grow under the ground. They all correspond to your anatomy, and they all have a tank to go in to be absorbed. Now, if you're sick by eating out of the time cycle, then you can correct it by eating in the time cycle. And nine times out of 10, people who come to me that are sick, evidence point that they're eating foods out of their time cycle. And the obvious problems they have is mucus, nerve pain, gas, dizziness, weakness, tiredness, and inability to cope with their daily life, 
and they find every type of excuse that somebody is doing it to them. <laughs> <laughs> but if they told you that I specialize in solar nutrition, it is because I had to heal myself of cancer and other diseases and a broken body. And I've tried every other method, even to lose weight. They're all good methods. I don't discredit them. I respect them all from wherever they come from. But it didn't correct my problem. And I worked with a wonderful person who is a, a devout Krishna from the Krishna movement. He was their number one chef. Studied all the Vedantic knowledge of cooking. Couldn't heal himself of a simple illness after following all the Vedantic studies. And finally ended up at my clinic. And the first thing I look at him, I says, how come you and I are born from the same country and you can't find out how to correct the problem after studying all these religious knowledge? He says, I don't know why. I said it's because you're eating certain foods at the wrong time. He said, well, that don't make sense. All the food I eat is healthy food. They're, they're all vegetarian. He said, yes, but you don't know your blood type. If you knew, you would quit doing certain type of foods and put them in the right time cycle. He ran away. I didn't see him for 28 days. Now he's still the number one chef in a brand new restaurant, all geared to solar nutrition cooking. <laughs> <laughs> he has taken their Vedic knowledge and regulated it to time and feed them now in the menu. Is Vedic eating, vegetarian eating, but synchronized the proper timing for the first time? It's not a, a secret, it's knowing when. That's what I specialize in. What do you do when you get a yet? Huh? What do you do when you get a yet? You know, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you say, Oh, ice cream. <laughs> that ah, ice cream. Now we call that lunar nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> I I also indulge in lunar nutrition. <laughs> because you see the human body is not designed to be 100% solar, neither 100% lunar. You're not two ovums put together, or two sperms put together. You are a sperm and an ovum put together. The sperm is the alkaline part of you, and the ovum is the acid part of you. And you're 80% alkaline and 20% acid. Every 28 days, the ovum is formed and released. Now, a pregnant woman would eventually wake up at 2 in the morning and go look for a, a sour pickle and yogurt and ice cream. <laughs> and that's valid because the chemistry requires that. And she only does it for a certain length of time in the 28 days of the pregnancy. It's knowing when to put it in. And therefore, in this country, we don't suffer from malnutrition or lack of nutrition. We suffer from wrong timing. It's called potluck eating. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago at the frontiers, on a Sunday, all the folks would get together the church and bring what they had. And after the ceremony is over, they spread the cloth out and put it all there to be eaten. Well, the women will get off to themselves because they are watching their figure, so they will pick and then they will discuss the latest fashions of how to weave. The men will get off and discover what to do with Jake, the horse, because he's a miserable creature who wants to find a mechanical horse now. So they'll be plotting how to make the mechanical horse and get rid of Jake, the real horse. In the meantime, you and I, like kids, we crawl over the tablecloth and put it in our mouth. <laughs> and then we get nice and chubby. It's called potluck eating, but that's valid from age one to 31. 
Du är rädd att de har kett upp. Det är inte rätt att vara här. If you pass 31, then you're in the cleanup process. If you're not there, keep on going. <laughs> you see, it wouldn't make sense to you if you try to correct the body if you haven't saturated it with incorrect eating. This method would not make any sense to a person. But if you trace back the origin of the two laws on the line, if you will see that the wise men that gave the laws did live, and these laws are still today with us. A little of anything is medicine for the system. Too much is toxic. The fellow that gave that was a guy named Confucius. Pretty corny. <laughs> Confucius. And the other one waited many, many years after to discover that something was lacking in it. And he came up and said one day, there's a time and a place and a season for everything. His name was Solomon. So look how long between Solomon and Confucius, men were busy mucking it up and cleaning it up until <laughs> they find out timing. But by that same process, we have a lot of religious ideas coming down and involving the relationship to get back to the source of our spiritual nature. But we cannot separate spirituality from health. It's highly erroneous to say a spiritual person is an unhealthy person. It's not true. If you're spiritual, you will be healthy. You've got something that causes everybody. Otherwise, you're not spiritual. You're missing the boat. The spiritual person is functioning on a scientific process that produces results and doesn't have to go off in any location to do it. Right on his two feet, there he is. He can do the process of starting the, the thing up. And he doesn't have to wait to be told by any belief system what to do. His own body will become the uh, obvious thing. So solar nutrition is geared to time, not what. Did you hear about Norman Tyson's and how he healed uh, the uh, illness that was in the colleges? He was literally coming unglued at the scenes when he healed this illness through laughter and other holistic things. I don't believe I've heard anything about uh, hearing the kind of food or the timing of it as related to healing his illness. That's an entirely new concept for me. There are three types of uh, remedies for every illness, nutrition, psychological, and uh, placebo. Nutrition can be chemical, psychological can be programming, and placebo is we can fool ourselves into getting well. All three work. Depends on your toxicity, and at the time you have the problem and your attitude to yourself. Now you see why all work. The collagen in the body can be healed by laughter for some people. It may be healed by placebo to fool himself or herself or by chemical induction or nutrition. It, sickness is not what we think it is. Sickness is one's own karmic obligation to an unfulfilled pattern not result in a past life must be paid off in this life. For example, let's say two lives ago you hurt 15 people and you were able to resolve the hurt by meeting 10 of them and became friends again and resolved it. Five of them could not be met because they passed on. And you will have to go out of the body with the unresolved five. Then you'll come into your next life, which will be the last life, and you may run into three of those people in that life, and you may resolve it. You still got two more to go. But in the meantime, in that last life, you don't go bump into another 20. You see? And you resolve 
maybe seven or eight out of that 20. So then you can take the sum total of what is left over, and then this by far you got to resolve. And you're only resolving it in the form of a sickness. You're going to find some ache or pain is going to show up, some person is going to cause it to occur in you, and you'll finally have to face it and resolve it. So, none of the things that are happening to people and they seem miraculous, they are working out an unfinished obligation. I've been in the miraculous, I've fell in the miraculous, and I've broken my body up. But I've had to heal the body or go through the healing in a non dramatic way. My body healed itself, all the functions came back normal except the bone. The day I was told I would be healed dramatically. That was on the third day after, or fourth day after my accident. Then, dramatically would have mean I'd walk immediately off the bed, broken bones and everything would have sealed up. That would have been dramatic. Yet I'd be the living freak today because I'm not able to explain to you who is suffering and you would want something so dramatic that you would push yourself out of psychological balance just to get that dramatic. That is not valid. The psychic or miraculous healings are for people who have gone to the bottom and out of desperation and have been pushed back to have a chance to reconcile. So a great deal of their unfinished patterns is like a unpaid bills are relieved by an inheritance come to you. But they still got some more to pay. So that big lump sum can fall in their lap and relinquish the debt. We don't know how many people we've hurt or have hurt us because we have to tap the memory banks. So that uh, form of healing is valid and for that person who discovered it. Soul of nutrition may be valid for me, may not be valid for you. See what I mean? Again, it's knowing what uh, lunar nutrition may be more valid for you than for me. So, again, each one of us has different things to work on. They are type A, plus or minus, type B, plus or minus, the plus or minus are the RH factors, and then there's A, B, plus, minus, and there's O, plus or minus. Now, A and A, B, plus or minus, can be 100% non-meat eater, but they cannot be 100% uh, meat eater. They will develop acidosis if they try to be 100% meat eater. But they can live 100% non-meat eater. Most people who go into the spiritual life and make any headway that are usually a type A and an AB type. I don't happen to be a type A or AB, I happen to be an O. So B and O, <laughs> can be a 100% meat eater, but cannot be a 100% non-meat eater. We develop another type of disease called alcoholosis or pain or strictures, tensions. And also there's an outward rash where the skin is dry, but it doesn't weep. Whereas the, the A and the AB will develop another type of rash where it could weep because we try to be 100% pure in any one of the other things. It's not possible. Nature did not allow us to come out that way. There are reasons why we're like that. And they are, we are placed in these types to work out the karmic obligation. If you're going to go back to the source of your nature immediately, you may be...